Let's talk about second derivative and concavity. So let's remember uh, what we do for first derivative as far as notation goes. We could write uh, first derivative as y primed. That's one of the ways we can write it. So I'll write it like this, y primed. Or we could do it like uh, dy dx. Mm, or we could say it's something like f primed of x. Those are the three most common conventions. Well, what's the second derivative? I'll give you a hint, the good news is the second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. So once you found out what this is, just take that derivative, and that's called the second derivative. Technically, you can do higher order ones. You can do the third and fourth and fifth and whatever derivatives too, but let's just stick with the first and second derivatives. So by this notation, then what can we say? Well, we can say that this right here will be y prime primed. Or we can say, now this is a weird one. We'll skip it for a second. This one here could be f prime primed of x. This one, however, has something a little bit weird. Watch carefully. It goes d squared y, it almost looks like, like this, and this one here goes dx squared. It's a little bit funny how we do the d squared first and the dx squared like that. But this is the common notation that we use for the second derivative. So you might see it written like this, or like this, or like this. What does it mean? It just means do the derivative of the derivative. That's really all it means. So let's keep going. Uh, let's look at an example from graphs. So what if you're not given an equation of something, but you're just given the graph of something? So I've got an example from physics where this, uh, I'll show you later on when we do kinematics, but um, this right here could be displacement, this one here could be the velocity, this one here would be acceleration, and these are, these are actually phrased in exactly the same way. So watch carefully. What if I do the, um, the f prime of x, oh, sorry, just f of x, just like this. This could be this function like this. So this is something that goes up and goes down. It's some sort of quadratic. In real life, this would be the displacement uh, over time. This would be something like I roll something up a hill, and it would go up the hill, then it would come back down the hill. Remember, this is time, though. So it would actually come back to itself. Like it could come back to where it started, over here. So this is some time later. Now, the derivative, let's think about this now. The value of the derivative is equal to the gradient of this first one. So let's just watch very, very carefully here and see if we can figure this out here. So at this particular point right here, what's the gradient doing right here? Well, the gradient, do you see it? The gradient is positive. It's some positive number. Over here, the gradient is zero, isn't it? And over here, the gradient is some negative number. So watch very carefully then. I'm going to say positive. Here, I'm going to say negative. Whatever that positive number, let's just assume it's uh, this number right here, whatever that is. Now, this one right here it's flat here, so the gradient is zero. That means the y value, because remember, this represents the y value of it, the y value is zero at this, so it's gonna match right here. This one here is some negative number, so that means the y value of it over at this x value here, the y value will be some negative number. In fact, if we do it right, it should be a straight line. So it should look like well, something like this. Now, what if I do the second derivative, which is the derivative of the derivative? So just take a look at this one now, because it gets too confusing to look at the first one. So just look at the first one gets you the second one, right? Then the second one gets you the third one. Or you could say the first one, sorry, the um, derivative is gotten from the original. The second derivative is gotten from the first derivative. So let's take a look and see if this will make any sense. So this one right here, let's see, this one is the derivative of the derivative. Well, what's the gradient right here? Isn't it some negative number? What's the gradient right here? Isn't it some negative number? What's the gradient here? Some negative number. In fact, it's the same steepness, isn't it? So it's gonna be the same constant negative number. So maybe like, maybe like this, whatever that negative number is. And if you do it right, if you did this experiment right, this would actually would be some um, like can rolling up a hill. This here would be the velocity, and this here would be the acceleration, and it would look like this. What I kind of like about it is if you look at what kind of graphs these are, look carefully. What if this was some sort of, um, I mean, it's sort of some kind of y equals x squared. I know it's not equal to x squared because it would go up like this, but it's some kind of x squared. Of course, it's been shifted to the right and up and flipped upside down, but some kind of thing like this. That means y prime, then, if you look carefully, x squared, the derivative of that would just be 2 times x. Do you notice it's a straight line? So look, this is a parabola. Isn't that kind of neat? Look, a parabola. So it may be something like this. This here would be a straight line, so maybe like that. And what would this be? Well, the derivative of this one here would just be a constant. It's just a constant number. 
and a constant number would just be something that goes like flat like this. Isn't that kind of cool? So that's why you can sort of see the, the shapes actually changing. Each time you do a derivative, you lose one power in your polynomial. So it goes from squared to linear, from linear to constant. And look at those shapes. Isn't that kind of cool? So that's how these can work. Let's put it all together. So remember that the first derivative tells you about the gradient. Okay, so that was uh, sort of, we've already learned about that. First derivative is the gradient of the tangent. So now what's new is this one right here. The second derivative tells you some other feature. So it's not the gradient, because the first derivative is that. This tells us something called concavity. What does that mean? Well, if something is concave up, let me just show you what that looks like. That's when the second derivative is greater than zero. And if something is concave down, it's going to be the second derivative is less than zero. What does that look like on a graph? Well, if this here is some sort of graph, this here could be some sort of graph here like this. This would be x and y, x and y. Let me show you something that's got a concavity that's up. In other words, concave up all the time. Maybe something like this. See, it's always opening upwards. This one here is always opening downwards. That's why I like this little picture with the cats, because it does show it. Look, second derivative is greater than zero. Look, it's concave up. And the second derivative is less than zero. Look, it's concave down. At least the back of the cat is. So this does tell you the way that a function opens. It tells you sort of the opening of it. It opens up or down. And just like we had uh, for derivatives, where you set the first derivative equal to zero, it told you something about the max and min points, while well, setting the second derivative equal to zero also tells you something. This is the important thing. We call it an inflection point. And it's only an inflection point if two things happen. If, first of all, the second derivative equals zero, and just like before with the first derivative, your second derivative has to change sign left and right, because it could be something where the second derivative is zero, but the second derivative doesn't change sign. I'll show you that uh, in a second. So this, this could be something that looks like, I don't know, let's see. So something like, let's show an inflection point. If this is x and y. Let me show you a graph that has an inflection point. Maybe something that goes like, I don't know, maybe like something like this. Do you notice then, at this point right here, do you notice it's opening downwards? Over here though, it's kind of opening upwards, isn't it? Well, there's a place where those change. That place where they change, is, I don't know, maybe it's here on this graph right here. That right here would be your inflection point. And why is that? Let me just show you here, so this inflection point. That'll be because the f prime prime of x is probably gonna be zero, the second derivative will be zero. And, look carefully here, to the left it's concave down, do you see that? It's opening downwards, and here it's opening upwards. So you notice the concavity changed. In other words, it went from opening downwards to opening upwards. And I really imagine like a ball actually sitting in there, if it can sort of sit there, if you can sort of hold some water in there or something like that, it's concave up. So that's what I like to use. I like this picture here, concave down, local maximum. Why is that? Well, look, look at his mouth. See that? So if his mouth is sort of lower like this right here, that's going to help us for something. So remember that the something, when we're looking at local max and min, so we're, we're back to derivatives. Remember that if we're looking for a local maximum or minimum, we found that we could determine if it is a local max or min by first of all finding that the derivative is zero, but then you had to find that the derivative changes left to right. That was a sign diagram we did. But there's another way we could do it. That's what's actually really handy. You could use a second derivative instead. So watch carefully what you would do. You would first Still find the stationary point, so you still find where is f of x equal to zero. So just like before with the first derivative, you find that. But then what you do, you do something different here. So what you do here, maybe put it like this right here. Say so, ah, so at this point where this here equals zero, then you look at what happens. If the second derivative is greater than zero, then you know it opens upwards. If a second derivative is opening downwards, it's like this. Well, if it opens upwards, does that make sense? And that point then must be a minimum. Do you see that? Isn't that nice? So it's a minimum. It's a local minimum. And if it opens downwards, then this point right here then must be a local maximum. So you can actually tell what something is by not just the first derivative, but actually by the second derivative. So a local maximum. That's why I like this. Concave down, local maximum. Yep. That is actually how it works. So this, this little uh, meme here is actually mathematically pretty accurate. It's actually quite useful. So let's do a real example here. Let's do this one here, f of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 1. 
find the x value of f of x, uh, f prime prime of x is 0. Let's just try to do that. Well, first, we've got to find f prime of x, don't we? So let's just practice that. So first derivative, let's see, 3 comes in front, so it's 3 times x. 3 minus 1 is just 2, so there we go. Next one here, the 2 comes in front of here. 2 times minus 4 is minus 8. x to the power of, and 2 minus 1 is just 1, so it's just that. This name becomes just minus 2, because this is a little 1. 1 times minus 2 is that. This becomes x to the 0. That's just 1, so it cancels out. There's, there's no sense just saying times 1. Right? We don't bother with saying times 1. So there we go. And the derivative of a constant disappears, because you could imagine as a 0. 0 times anything goes poof, disappears. So this is the first derivative. Well, then the second derivative, then, I just do the derivative of the derivative. So I just keep going. 2 times 3 is 6, times x to the power of 1. This one here was a 1 before, so 1 times negative a is just negative 8, times x to the 0 just disappears. This one disappears as well. Boom! Here's my second derivative. Do you notice I went from a cubic to a square to a linear? Do you notice that? Well, that's actually what always happens. Each time you do a derivative, you lose power. You lose exponents, at least. It went from 3 to 2 to 1. The next one, by the way, the third derivative would just be a constant, It'd just be 6. Now we want to find out the x value when this is 0. So I hope it makes sense. We just set it. We just set it equal to 0. So because I say 0 equals 6x minus 8, hopefully you'll see I can move my 8 over. So 8 equals 6x. Therefore, I can say x equals, let's see, I divide both sides by 6. So 8 over 6. They both uh, reduce, though. Let's see, they both divide by 2. So 8 divided by 2 is 4. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So there we go. I'm done. I have x equals 4 over 3. Boom. Now, we should find out if it's an inflection point. Well, it's only an inflection point if, remember two things happen? So it's an inflection point if f prime primed of x equals 0 and f prime prime changes sign right, left to right. So let's just see if that happens. Whoops, left to right. Change the sign. I really gotta learn how to spell here. Sign left to right. There we go. So let's try it out. Is the second derivative equal to zero? Well, yes, that's why we found it. So we found that. Now we've got to do a second derivative sign diagram. Let's do a little test here and see what happens. So I'll just put down the x value here. Now up here I'm gonna be looking at f prime primed of x. And I know my value I'm looking at is x equals four over three. That's what I'm looking for, okay? So this is like 1.33, something like that. So maybe if I tested it out at one, and maybe if I tested it out at two, those would work, right? Because those are values that are less than four over three and greater than four over three. Let's test it out. So what is f prime prime at one? What does that give me? So I'm testing it at one here. And I don't care about the value, I just care about the sign, if it's positive or negative. So the second derivative, which is this right here, at one, six times one is six, six minus eight is a negative number. In other words, this thing opens downwards to the left of this thing. It's concave down. That's what this tells me. And let's see here what happens uh, on the, this side here. F prime primed of two, let's see what that gives me. If I put in a two here, two times six is 12, 12 minus eight is positive. So that means that it's concave up. So did it change sign? Yes, it did. So yes, uh, you know, you could say it is an inflection point, something like that, right? So yes, you know, x equals four over three is an inflection point. This is how we could say it. Okay, that's because I've checked that the sine diagram, I've checked that the, the second derivative changed left and right. So this is how I would do it. There we go. That's about everything we could uh, want to know about it. I mean, other questions could be a little bit sneaky, but uh, this is the, the main parts of what we needed, okay? So second derivative, just take the derivative of the first. Remember that you can find out if it's a local max or min, and you can also check if it's an inflection point by if the concavity changes left to right. That's all we need.